this section contains further comments about the unconscious mind and begins instructions on the first steps in making contact with it. The average individual has many demands made on him. During the whole of his waking hours, his eyes and ears are kept busy with a succession of sights and sounds, and at the same time, a ceaseless stream of thoughts flows through his mind as often as not accompanied by emotional activity. Much of this activity is carried out by the unconscious mind, but frequently much more energy and effort than should be necessary is taken up in performing these activities. By giving a little attention to the way in which the unconscious mind can be influenced, vast improvements can be made in the way it performs any task. Although not aware of it, everyone by means of the unconscious mind already performs extraordinarily complex activities. For example, a man walking down a busy street is thinking of some problem. There will be in all the sights and sounds which go to make up the noise and distraction of a street. The man busy with his own thoughts will pay no attention to the noise or to stop windows or people passing. But should a friend come walking towards him, or should someone suddenly call his name, his thoughts will be instantly switched to his friend or to the person who has called out his name. Although he was not consciously aware of, aware of all the sights and sounds going on around him, his unconscious mind had been busy noticing them all. But like a good servant, had not reported to him matters which were of no importance. In this way, leaving his conscious mind free to attend to more important matters, while his unconscious mind attends to routine matters. In short, the unconscious mind of any any hypnotist, though he may never have thought about it, never thought about psychology, is already highly trained. If he wishes, he can delegate to it many tasks which it can carry out much more efficiently than can be done by use of the conscious mind. The success of all suggestion depends on gaining cooperation of the unconscious mind. And if it is approached with sincerity and patience, it will allow man to tap energies he never dreamed he possessed, carry out feats which seemed impossible, and cure complaints which had been regarded as hopeless. But this is dependent on his working with and not against the laws which govern our being. Whatever task faces one in life, whether it is to cure a illness, alter a habit, or make a success of a job, or master the techniques of self-suggestion, there is no more important question than how can I get the cooperation of my unconscious mind? Often when trying to influence his unconscious mind, a man may encounter obstacles. Sometimes when he exerts his will to influence his unconscious, he may discover there is in the structure of the mind something which prevents his instruction getting through. He may say to himself, I am not going to smoke another cigarette, but later finds he is still smoking. For some reason, his instructions have failed to get through to, these un to his unconscious mind. The man trying only with his willpower and courage to overcome his problem may think it is a defeat to admit he cannot force his unconscious mind to do what he wills, but he can, like Arjuna, acquire the superior weapons which will enable him to succeed. We cannot force our unconscious to work for us, but we can get its aid by using more informed methods. These methods enable us to enlist the help of the positive elements in the unconscious mind, which are themselves striving to restore harmonious functioning. The task of getting suggestions through to the positive elements in the unconscious mind is simplified if we think of our mental makeup as a business house with departments on different floors. On the first floor are the joint managers, the intellect and the will. These represent the conscious mind. On the lower floors are the workers who will carry out any orders they are given and whose work is to maintain the routine functioning of the emotional and physical life. 
these workers, broadly speaking, represent the unconscious mind. They are protected by a guard whose function is to prevent orders getting through to the workers, for they will do what they are told, irrespective what it, of what it is or who tells them. The guard is there to stop them. Otherwise, people, after watching a TV program, would rush out and buy, and buy detergents, foods, or anything else. The scientifically designed suggestions of the TV advertisement have had instructed them to purchase. Continuing this simplified picture of getting suggestions through to the workers in the unconscious mind, we first adopt the strategy of lulling the guard into quiescent state and quietly passing messages to help to the helpers, to the helpful workers who are themselves striving to correct whatever deviation there may be from a healthy, happy life. The first step in lulling the guard is achieved by carrying out physical relaxation. Though relaxing sounds simple, it is something which has to be learned and there is no one who cannot learn to relax, however tense he may be if he is patient and persistent. Once the ability is acquired, it is as though shutters have been drawn on the outside world and attention is turned inwards. Recuperative processes begin and energy replenishes tired muscles, energy levels rise, and the guard is lowered into a quiescent state, creating favorable conditions for administer administering self-suggestions. The following instructions deal with general relaxation, which is a helpful condition for the creation of self-hypnosis or the state of maximum suggestibility. The object in view is to attain a physical state in which tension is absent. This state is brought about not by learning new things to do, but by stopping various activities which are already going on. Some people will find that if they spend a minute or two in deep breathing before the relaxation session, it helps them to unwind and to let go more rapidly. This does not apply to everyone, and by experiment, you will see if it is helpful or otherwise to you personally. The following exercises deal with the cultivation of relaxation or letting go by cultivating muscular limpness. When the body is relaxed, mental and emotional activities are influenced by this physical relaxation and are also quietened down. These are the first steps in letting go. When a limb is relaxed, it is limp. It will lie motionless and inert. If it were lifted, bent or moved by someone else, no resistance or rigidity would be detected. It will move easily as though it were a piece of limp rope. This relaxation is employed naturally by many animals, of which the cat is a good example. The flaccid way in which it can let its muscles relax completely is very instructive and helpful by way of illustration in carrying out the following exercises. In speaking of relaxation, the term letting go has been used. The question might be asked, letting go of what? The answer would be to let go the tensions which cause restlessness and lack of ease. The difficulty with many people is that they have become habitually tensed up and this overactive state of their nerves, of their nerves and become their normal condition. They have forgotten how to let go. To achieve relaxation, it is necessary to let the tensions die down. But as we have said, the tense individual may not be fully aware of all the tensions in himself. Some of the signs are to be seen in frowns, blinking, restlessness, movements, and lack of repose. The first exercise is directed towards educating the individual to recognize tension in himself as the first step to removing it. 
when he can recognize its presence, he can also recognize its absence. Relaxation is nothing more than the absence of tension. If during the first attempts, when carrying out the exercises, your attention is distracted by some imaginary stiffness or awkwardness in posture or involuntary swallowing and the like, do not attempt to force these distractions out of your mind. They cannot be banished by a direct effort of the will. As far as possible, turn the whole of your attention to the detail of the particular exercise upon which you are engaged. You may fail a number of times, but if you persevere repeatedly, the distractions will gradually cease as the nervous activity, of which the irritations are merely symptoms, quietens down. The messages which may be flashed into consciousness, such as, my neck is stiff, my mouth is dry, and so on, are due to the overactive sensory nerves. The fidgeting, twitching, and other movements are due to motor nerve impulses, which are consciously or unconsciously attempting to relieve the real or imagined irritation. Tension, in some degree, is always present, even when we think we are relaxed. Our purpose is to reduce this tension to minimum so that the symptoms of this overactivity ceases.